Hello everyone. So Christmas time is here again and we're all starting to pull out our little uh, little traditions. And I thought it'd be fun to share one of mine with you. Every Christmas for the last couple of years, I've taken the time to read The Hogfather by Mr. Terry Pratchett. And I thought it'd be fun for me to uh, read it aloud and share this wonderful story by one of my very favorite authors. So here we go. Everything starts somewhere, although many physicists disagree. But people have always been dimly aware of the problems with the start of things. They wonder aloud how the snowplow, dr snowplow driver gets to work, or how the makers of dictionaries look up the spelling of the words. Yet there is the constant desire to find some point in the twisting, nodding, raveling nets of space-time on what a metaphorical finger can be put to indicate that here, here is the point where it all began. Something began when the Guild of Assassins enrolled Mr. Teotimi, who saw things differently from other people. And one of the ways that he saw things differently from other people was in seeing other people as things. Later, Lord Downey of the Guild said, We took pity on him because he'd lost both parents at an early age. I think that, upon reflection, we sort of wondered a bit more about that. But it was much earlier, even than that, when most people forgot that the very oldest stories are, sooner or later, about blood. Later on, they took the blood out to make the stories more acceptable to children. Or at least to the people who had to read them to children rather than the children themselves, who, on the whole, are quite keen on blood provided it's being said by the deserving. One of the things Harry Pratt did is he has little appendices on the page with little sides. Uh, I'm going to be including them, uh, and this is the first. That is to say, those who deserve to shed blood, or possibly not, you never quite know with some kids, and then wondered where the stories went. And earlier still, when something in the darkness of the deepest caves and gloomiest forests fought, what are they? these creatures. I will observe them. And much, much earlier than that, when the disc world was formed, drifting onwards through space, atop four elephants, on the shell of the giant turtle, the great Atun. Possibly as it moves, it gets tangled like a blind man in a cobwebbed house in those highly specialized little space-time strands that tried to breed in every history they encounter, stretching them and breaking them and tugging them into new shapes. Or possibly not, of course. The philosopher Didactylos has summed up an alternative hypothesis as things just happen. What the hell? I'm, uh, I'm more inclined for that one, to be honest. Pardon me. The senior wizards of Onsen University stood and looked at the door. There was no doubt that whoever had shut it wanted it to stay shut. Dozens of nails secured it to the door flame. Planks had been nailed right across, and finally it had, up until this morning, been hidden by a bookcase that had been put in front of it. And there's the sign, Ridcully, said the dean. You have read it, I assume. You know, the sign which says, do not, under any circumstances, open this door. Of course I've read it, said Ridicoli. Why do you think I want it opened? Er, why? said the lecturer in recent runes. To see why they wanted it shut, of course. This exchange contains almost all you need to know about human civilization. At least those bits of it that are 
now under the sea, fenced off, or still smoking. He gestured to Moto, the university's gardener and odd job dwarf who was standing by with a crowbar. Go to it, lad. The gardener saluted. Right jaw, sir. <laughs> Against the background of splintering timber, Rickley went on. It says on the plans that this was a bathroom. There's nothing frightening about a bathroom, for God's sakes. I want a bathroom. I'm fed up with sluicing down with you fellows. It's, it's unhygienic. You can catch stuff, my father told me. Where you get lots of people bathing together, the little Veruca gnome is running around with his little sack. Is that like the tooth fairy, said the dean sarcastically. I'm in charge here and I want a bathroom of my own, said Ridkilly firmly. And that's all there is to it, all right? I want a bathroom in time for Hogswatt's night, understand? And that's a problem with beginnings, of course. Sometimes, when you're dealing with occult realms that have quite a different attitude to time, you get the effect a little way before the cause. From somewhere on the edge of hearing came a glingle, glingle, glingle noise, like little silver bells. Hold on one second, gotta put the camera on charge. Stay, you bloody thing. There we are. Sorry about that. I'm working on a quite low-tech setup. No worry. Ah. At about the same time as the Arts Chancellor was laying down the law, Susan Stu Hellett was sitting up in bed reading by candlelight. Frost patterns curled across the windows. She enjoyed these early evenings once she had put the children to bed. She was more or less left to her own devices. Mrs. Gator was pathetically scared of giving her any instructions, even though she paid Susan's wages. Not that the wages were important, of course. What was important was that she was being her own person and holding down a real job. And being a governess was a real job. The only tricky bit had been the embarrassment when her employer found out that she was a duchess. Because in Mrs. Gator's book, which was a rather short book with big handwriting, the upper crust wasn't supposed to work. It was supposed to loaf around. It was all Susan could do to stop her curtsying when they met. A flicker made her turn her head. The candle flame was streaming out horizontally, as though in a hurling wind. Howling wind. She looked up, the curtains billowed away from the window, which flung itself open with a clutter. But there was no wind. At least, no wind in this world. Images formed in her mind, a red ball, the sharp smell of snow, and then... They were gone. Instead, there were teeth, said Susan aloud. Teeth again. She blinked. When she opened her eyes, the window was, as she knew it would be, firmly shut. The, camera, the curtain hung demurely. The candle flame was innocently upright. Oh no, not again. Not after all this time. Everything had been going so well. Susan... She looked around. Her door had been pushed open and a small figure stood there, barefoot in a nightdress. She sighed. Yes, Troila. I'm afraid of the monster in the cellar, Fusen. It's gonna eat me up. Susan shut her book firmly and raised a warning finger. What have I told you about trying to sound ingratiatingly cute, Twyla? She said. The little girl said, you said I mustn't. You said the exaggerated lisping is a hanging offense and I only do it to get attention. Good. Do you know what the monster it is, what monster it is this time? It's the big hairy one with, ah, Susan raised her fingers. With eight arms, Twyla corrected herself. What? Again? Oh, all right. She got out of bed and put on her dressing gown, trying to stay quite calm 
while the child watched her. So, they were coming back. Oh, not the monster in the cellar. That was all in a day's work. But it looked as if she was going to start remembering the future again. She shook her head. However far you ran away, you always caught yourself up. But monsters were easy. At least. She learned how to deal with monsters. She picked up the poker from the nursery fender and went down the back stairs with Twyla following her. The gators were having a dinner party. Muffled voices came from the direction of the dining room. Then, as she crept past, the door opened, and yellow light spilled out of it, and a voice said, Ye gods! There's a girl in a nightshirt out here with a poker! She saw faces silhouetted in the light and made out the worried face of Mrs. Gator. Susan, uh, what are you doing? Susan looked at the poker, and then back at the woman. Twyla said she's afraid of a monster in the cellar, Mrs. Gator. And you're going to attack it with a poker, eh? Said one of the guests. There was a strong atmosphere of brandy and cigars. Yes, Susan said simply. Susan's our governess, said Mrs. Gator. Er, uh, I told you about her. There was a change in the expression on the faces peering out from the dining room. It became a sort of amused respect. She beats up monsters with a poker, said someone. Actually, that's a very clever idea, said someone else. Little girl gets into her head, there's a monster in the cellar. You go in with the poker and make a few bashing noises while the child listens and everything's all right. Good thinking, that girl. Very sensible. Very modern. Is, is that what you're doing, Susan? Said Mrs. Gator anxiously. Yes, Mrs. Gator, said Susan obediently. This I've got to watch, Spilo. It's not every day you see monsters beaten up by a gal, said the man behind her. There was a swiss of silk and a cloud of cigar smoke as the diners poured out into the hall. Susan sighed again and went down the cellar stairs while Twyla sat demurely at the top, hugging her knees. A door opened and shut. There was a short period of silence, and then a terrifying scream. One woman fainted, and a man dropped his cigar. You don't have to worry. Everything will be all right, said Twyla calmly. See, always wins. Everything will be all right. There were fuds and clangs, and then a whirring noise, and finally a sort of bubbling. Susan pushed open the door. The poker was bent at right angles. There was nervous applause. Very well done, said a guest. Very psychological. Clever idea, that, bending the poker. And I expect you're not afraid anymore, eh, little girl? No, said Twyla. Very psychological. Susan says, don't get afraid, get angry said Twyla. I like this kid a lot. Er, thank you, Susan, said Mrs. Gator, now a trembling bouquet of nerves. And er, now, Sir Geoffrey, if you'd all like to come back into the parlor, I, I, I mean the drawing room. The party went back up the hall. The last thing Susan heard before the door shut was, that's convincing the way she bent the poker like that. She waited. Have they all gone, Twyla? Yes, Susan. Good. Susan went back into the cellar and emerged, towing something large and hairy with eight legs. She managed to haul it up the steps and down the other passage to the backyard, where she kicked it out. It would evaporate before dawn. And that's what we do to monsters, she said. Twyla watched carefully. And now it's bed for you, my girl, said Susan, picking her up. Can I have the poker in my room for the night? All right. It only kills monsters, doesn't it? The child said sleepily as Susan carried her upstairs. That's right, Susan said. All kinds. She put the girl to bed next to her brother and leaned the poker against the toy cupboard. The poker was made of some cheap metal with a brass knob on the end. She would, Susan reflected, give quite a lot to be able to use it on the children's previous governess. Good night. Good night. 
So he went back to her own small bedroom and got back into bed, watching the curtains suspiciously. It would be nice to think she'd imagined it. It would also be stupid to think that too. But she'd been nearly normal for two years now, making her own way in the real world, never remembering the future at all. Perhaps she just dreamed things. But even dreams could be real. She tried to ignore the long thread of wax that suggested the candle had just for a few seconds streamed in the wind. As Susan shot sleep, Lord Downey sat in his study catching up on the paperwork. Lord Downey was an assassin. <coughs> Pardon me. Lord Downey was an assassin, or rather an assassin. The capital letter was important. It separated those curs who went around murdering people for money from the gentlemen who were occasionally consulted by other gentlemen who wished to have removed for consideration any inconvenient razor blades from the candy floss of life. The members of the Guild of Assassins considered themselves cultured men who enjoyed good music and food and literature, and they knew the value of human life. To a penny in many cases. Lord Downey's study was oak paneled and well carpeted. The furniture was very old and quite worn, but the wear was the wear that comes only when very good furniture is carefully used over several centuries. It was matured furniture. A log fire burned in the grate. And in front of it, a couple of dogs were sleeping in the tangled way of large, hairy dogs everywhere. Apart from the occasional doggy snore or the crackle of a shifting log, there were no other sounds but the scratching of Lord Downey's pen and the ticking of the long case clock by the door. Small, private noises which only served to define the silence. At least this was the case until someone cleared their throat. The sound suggested very clearly that the purpose of the exercise was not to erase the presence of a troublesome bit of biscuit, but merely to indicate in the politest possible way the presence of the throat. Downey stopped writing but did not raise his head. Then, after what appeared to be some consideration, he said in a businesslike voice, The doors are locked. The windows are barred. The dogs do not appear to have woken up. The squeaky floorboards haven't. Other little arrangements, which I will not specify, seem to have been bypassed. That severely limits the possibilities. I really doubt that you are a ghost. And gods generally do not denounce themselves so politely. You could, of course, be deaf. But I don't believe he bothers with such niceties. And besides, I'm feeling quite well. Hmm. Something hovered in the air in front of his desk. My teeth are in fine condition, so you are unlikely to be the tooth fairy. I've always found that a stiff brandy before bedtime does quite away with the need for the Sandman. And since I can carry a tune quite well, I suspect I'm not likely to attract the attention of old man trouble. Hmm. The figure drifted a little nearer. I suppose a gnome could get down through a mouse hole, but I have traps down. Down he went on. Boogeymen can walk through walls, but would be very loath to reveal themselves. Really, you have me at a loss, hmm? And then he looked up. A gray robe hung in the air. It appeared to be occupied and that it had a shape, although the occupant was not visible. The prickly feeling crept over Downey that the occupant wasn't invisible, merely not in any physical sense there at all. Good evening, he said. The robe said, good evening, Lord Downey. Ah, I got them mixed up. 
His brain registered the words. His ears swore they hadn't heard them. But you not be, they did not become head of the assassin skill by taking fright easily. Besides, the thing wasn't frightening. It was, thought Downey, astonishingly dull. If monotonous drabness could take on a shape, this would be the shape it would choose. You appear to be a specter, he said. Our nature is not a matter for discussion, arrived in his head. We offer you a commission. You wish someone inhumed, said Lord Downey, brought to an end. Downey considered this. It was not as unusual as it appeared. There were precedents. Anyone could buy the services of the guild. Several zombies had in the past employed the guild to settle score with their murderers. In fact, the guild, he liked to think, practiced the ultimate democracy. They didn't need intelligence, societal position, beauty, or charm to hire it. You just needed money. Which, unlike the other stuff, was available to everyone. Except for the poor, of course, but there was no helping some people. Brought to an end. That was an odd way of putting it. We can, he began. The payment will reflect the difficulty of the task. Our scale of fees, the payment will be three million dollars. Downey sat back. That was four times higher than any fee yet earned by any member of the guild. And that had been a special family rate, including overnight guests. No questions asked, I assume, he said, buying time. No questions answered. But does the suggested fee represent the difficulty involved? The client is heavily guarded? Not guarded at all, but almost certainly impossible to delete with conventional weapons. Downey nodded. This was not necessarily a big problem, he said to himself. The guild had amassed quite a few unconventional weapons over the years. Delete, an unusual way of putting it. We like to know for whom we are working, he said. We are sure you do. I mean that we need to know your name, or names, in strict calling conventionality, of course. We have to write something down in our files. You may think of us as the auditors. Really? What is it you audit? Everything. I think we need to know something about you. We are the people with three million dollars. Downey took the point, although he didn't like it. Three million dollars could buy a lot of no questions. Really, he said, in the circumstances, since you are a new client, I think we would like payment in advance. As you wish, the gold is now in your vaults. You mean that it will shortly be in our vaults, said Downey. No, it has always been in your vaults. We know this because we have just put it there. Downey watched the empty hood for a moment, and then, without shifting his gaze, he reached out and picked up the speaking tube. Tube. Mr. Winvo, he said after whistling into it. Ah, good. Tell me, how much do we have in our vaults at the moment? Oh, approximately, to the nearest million, say. He held the tube away from his ear for a moment, and then spoke into it again. Well, be a good chap and check anyway, will you? He hung up the tube and placed his hands flat on the desk in front of him. Can I offer you a drink while we wait, he said. Yes, we believe so. Downey stood up with some relief and walked over to the large drinks cabinet. His hand hovered over the guild's ancient and valuable tantalus, with its labeled decanters of myrrh, nig, trop, and ikisu. It's a sad and terrible thing that highborn folk really have thought that the servants would be totally fooled if spirits were put into the decanters. 
that were cuttingly labeled backwards. And also throughout history, the more politically conscious butler has taken it on trust and with rather more justification that his employers will not notice if the whiskey is topped up with Iniru. This, uh, this joke probably works better written out than said. <laughs> you really should read this book. It's phenomenal. And what would you like to drink, he said, wondering where the auditor kept its mouth. His hand hovered for just a moment over the decanter marked no siop. We do not drink. But you did just say that I could offer you a drink. Indeed. We judge you fully capable of performing that action. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> ah. Downey's hand hesitated over the whiskey decanter. And then he thought better of it. At that point, the speaking tube whistled. Yes, Mr. Winvo, really? Indeed. I myself have frequently found loose chains on their sofa curtains. It's amazing how it mount. No, no, I wasn't being... Yes, I did have some reason to... No, no, no blame attaches to it. And wait, no, I could hardly see how it... Yes, go and have a rest. What a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> he hung up the tube again. The cowl hadn't moved. We will need to know where, when, and of course, who, he said after a moment. The cowl nodded. The location is not on any map. We would like the task to be completed within the week. This is essential. As for the who, a drawing appeared on Downey's desk, and in his head arrived the words, Let us call him the Fat Man. Is this a joke? said Downey. We do not joke. No, you don't, do you? Downey thought. He drummed his fingers. There are many who would say this person does not exist. He must exist. How else could you so readily recognize his picture? And many are in correspondence with him. Well, yes, of course, in a sense, he exists. In a sense, everything exists. It is cessation of existence that concerns us here. Finding him would be a little difficult. You will find persons on any street who can tell you his approximate address. Yes, of course, said Downey, wondering why anyone would call them persons. It was an odd usage. But as you say, I doubt they even could give a map reference. And even then, how could the, the fat man be inhumed? A glass of poisoned sherry, perhaps? The cowl had no face to crack a smile. You misunderstood the nature of employment, it said in Downey's head. He bridled at this. Assassins were never employed. They were engaged or retained or commissioned, but never employed. Only servants were employed. What is it that I misunderstand exactly, he said. We pay. You find the ways and means. The cowl began to fade. How can I contact you, said Downey. We will contact you. We know where you are. We know where everyone is. The figure vanished. At the same moment, the door was flung open to reveal the straw figure of Mr. Rinbo, the guild treasurer. Excuse me, my lord, but I really had to come up. He flung some desks on the desk. Look at them! Downey carefully picked up a golden circle. It looked like a small coin, but no denomination, said Windville. No heads, no tails, no milling. It's, it's just a blank disc. They're all just blank discs. Downey opened his mouth to say valueless. He realized that he was half help, but hoping this was the case. If they, whoever they were, had paid in worthless metal, then there wasn't even the glimmering of a contract, but he could see that wasn't the case. Assassins learn to recognize money early. 
in their careers. Blank discs, he said, of pure gold. Winvo nodded mutely. That, said Downey, will do nicely. It, it, it must be magical, said Winvo, and we never accept magical money. This poor guy's on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Downey bounced the coin on the desk a couple of times. It made a satisfying, satisfyingly rich, spunking noise. It wasn't magical. Magical money would look real because its whole purpose was to deceive. But this didn't need to ape something as human and adulterated as mere currency. This is gold, it told his fingers. Take it or leave it. Downey sat and thought while Winvo stood and worried. We'll take it, he said. But thank you, Mr. Winvo. That is my decision, said Downey. He stared into space for a while and then smiled. Is Mr. Tea Time still in the building? Winvo stood back. I thought the council had agreed to dismiss him, he said stiffly. After that business with... Mr. Tea Time does not not see the world in quite the same way as other people, said Downey. Picking up the picture from his desk and looking at it thoughtfully. Well, indeed, I think that is certainly true. Please send him up. The guild attracted all sorts of people, Downey reflected. He found himself wondering how it had come to attract Winvo. For one thing, it was hard to imagine him stabbing anyone in the heart in case he got blood on the victim's wallets, whereas Mr. Tea Time... The problem was that the guild took young boys and gave them a splendid education and incidentally taught them how to kill, cleanly and dispassionately, for money and the, for the good of society. Or at least that part of society that had money and whatever kind of society was there. But very occasionally you'd get someone like Mr. Tea Time, to whom the money was merely a distraction. Mr. Tea Time had a truly brilliant mind. But it was brilliant like a fractured mirror. All marvelous facets and rainbows, but ultimately also something that was broken. Mr. Tea Time enjoyed himself too much, and other people also. Downey had privately decided that sometime soon Mr. Tea Time was going to meet with an accident. Like many people with no actual morals, Lord Downey did have standards, and Tea Time repelled him. Assassination was a careful game, usually played against people who knew the rules themselves, or at least could afford the services of those who did. There was considerable satisfaction in a clean kill. What there wasn't supposed to be was pleasure in a messy one. That sort of thing led to talk. On the other hand, Teton's corkscrew of a mind was exactly the tool to deal with something like this. And if he didn't, well, that was hardly Downey's fault, was it? He turned his attention to the paperwork for a while. It was amazing how the stuff mounted up, but you had to deal with it. It wasn't as though they were murderers, after all. Heaven forbid. <laughs> there was a knock at the door. He pushed the paperwork aside and sat back. Come in, Mr. Tea Time, he said. It never hurts to put the other fellow in awe of you. In fact, the door was opened by one of the guild's servants, carefully balancing a tea tray. Ah, Carter, said Lord Downey, recovering magnificently. Just put it on the table over there, will you? Yes, sir, said Carter. He turned and nodded. Sorry, sir, I will go and fetch another cup directly, sir. What? For your visitor, sir? What visitor? Oh, and Mr. Tea Time, he stopped. He turned. There was a young man sitting on the hearth rug, playing with the dogs. Mr. Tea Time? It's pronounced Ta Timmy, sir, said T Ta Timmy with a, just a hint of reproach. Everyone gets it wrong, sir. 
I am going to mispronounce that horribly over the course of this. I apologize. <laughs> How did you do that? Pretty well. I got mildly scorched on the last few feet, of course. There were sore lamps of soot on the hearth rug. Downey realized he'd heard them fall, but that hadn't been particularly extraordinary. No one could get down the chimney. There was a heavy grid firmly in place near the top of the flue. But there's a blocked-in fireplace behind the old library, said Timmy. Apparently reading his thoughts, the flues connect them to the bars. It was really a stroll, sir. Really? Oh, yes, sir. Downey nodded. The tendency of old buildings to be honeycombed with sealed chimney flues was a fact you learned early in your career. And then he told himself, you forgot. It always paid to put the other fellow in awe of you, too. He had forgotten they taught that, too. The dogs seem to like you, he said. I get on well with animals, sir. Tatimi's face was young and open and friendly. Or at least it smiled all the time. But the effect was spoiled for most people by the fact that it had only one eye. Some unexplained accident had taken the other one. And the missing orb had been replaced by a ball of glass. The result was disconcerting. But what bothered Lord Downey far more was the man's other eye. The one that might loosely be called normal. He'd never seen such a small and sharp pupil. Ta-Time looked at the world through a pinhole. He found he'd retreated behind his desk again. There was that about Ta-Time. You always felt happier if you had something between you and him. You like animals, do you? He said. I have a report here that says you nailed Sir George's dog to the ceiling. Couldn't have it barking while I was working, sir. Some people would have drugged it. Oh. Tatame looked despondent for a moment, but then he brightened. But I definitely filled the contract, sir. There can be no doubt about that, sir. I checked George, Sir George's breathing with Amir as instructed. It's in my report. Yes, indeed. Apparently the man's head had been several feet from his body at that point. It was a terrible thought that Tateme might not see anything incongruous about this. And the servants, he said. Couldn't have them busting in, sir. Downey nodded, half hypnotized by the glassy stare and the pinhole, pinhole eyeball. No, you couldn't have them busting in, and an assassin might well face serious professional opposition. Possibly even by people trained by the same teachers. But an old man and a maidservant who merely had the misfortune to be in the house at the time. There was no actual rule, Downey had to admit. It was just that over the years, the guild had developed a certain ethos. And members tended to be very neat about their work, even shutting doors behind them and generally tidying them up as they went. Hurting the harmless was worse than transgressing against the moral fabric of society. It was a breach of good manners. It was worse even than that. It was bad taste. But there was no actual rule. Good God. Terry Pratchett is so very British. <laughs> that was all right, wasn't it, sir? said Tateme with apparent anxiety. It uh, lacked elegance, said Downey. Ah, thank you, sir. I'm always happy to be corrected. I shall remember that next time. Downey took a deep breath. It's about that I wish to talk, he said. He held the picture of the... What had the thing called him? The fat man? As a matter of interest, he said, how would you go about inhuming this gentleman? Anyone else he was sure would have burst out laughing. They would have said things like, Is this a joke, sir? Ta Teme merely leaned forward with a curious, intent expression. Difficult, sir. Certainly, Downey agreed. I would need some time to prepare a plan, sir. Ta Teme went on. Of course, and... 
There was a knock at the door and Carter came in with another cup and saucer. He nodded respectfully to Lord Downey and crept out again. Right, sir, said Tatemi. I'm sorry, said Downey, momentarily distracted. I have now thought of a plan, sir. You have? Yes, sir. As quickly as that. Yes, sir. Ye gods. Well, sir, you know how we are encouraged to consider hypothetical problems? Oh, yes, a very valuable exercise, Downey stopped and then looked shocked. You mean you have actually devoted time to considering how to inhume the hog father? He said weakly. You've actually sat down and thought out how to do it? You've actually devoted your spare time to the problem? Okay, I don't know if uh, it's come clear yet. Hogfather is basically Santa Claus. This guy, as a hobby, has been planning out his murder of Santa. Can you see why this is my favorite Christmas book? <laughs> oh, yes, sir. And the Soul Cake Duck. And the Sandman. And Death. Downey blinked again. You've actually sat down and considered how to... Yes, sir. I've amassed quite an interesting file. In my own time, of course. I want to be quite certain about this, Mr. Tatime. You have applied yourself to a study of ways of killing death. Only as a hobby, sir. Well, yes, hobbies, yes. I mean, I used to collect butterflies myself, said Downey, recalling those first moments of awakening pleasure at the use of poison in the pen. But... Actually, sir, the basic methodology is exactly the same as it would be for a human. Opportunity, geography, technique. You just have to work with the known facts about the individual concerned. Of course, with this one, since a lot is known. And you've worked it all out, have you? Said Downey, almost fascinated. Oh, a long time ago, sir. When, may I ask? I think it was when I was lying in bed one hogs once night, sir. My gods thought Downey, and to think that I just used to listen for sleigh bells. My word, he said aloud. I may have to check some details, sir. I'd appreciate access to some of the books in the dark library, but yes, I, I, I think I can see the basic shape. And yet this person, some people might say that he is technically immortal. Everyone has their weak points, sir. Even death? Oh, yes, absolutely, very much so. Really? Downey drummed his fingers on the desk again. The boy couldn't possibly have a real plan, he told himself. He certainly had a skewed mind. Skewed, it was a positive of helix. But the fat man wasn't just another target in some mansion somewhere. It was reasonable for him to assume that people had tried to trap him before. He felt happy about this. Tateme would fail, and possibly even fail fatally, if his plan was stupid enough, and maybe the guild would lose the gold, but maybe not. Very well, he said. I don't need to know what your plan is. That's just as well, sir. What do you mean? Because I don't propose to tell you, sir. You'd be obliged to disapprove of it. I am amazed that you are so confident that it can work, Tateme. I just think logically about the problem, sir, said the boy. He sounded reproachful. Logically, said Downey. I suppose I just see things differently from other people, said Tatemi. It was a quiet day for Susan, although on the way to the park, Gawain tried to uh, trod on a crack in the pavement, on purpose. One of the many terrors conjured up by the previous governess's happy way of children had been the bears that waited around in the street to eat you if you stood on the cracks. Susan had taken to carrying the wall, the poker, under her respectable coat. One wallop generally did the trick. They were amazed that anyone else saw them. Gawain, she said, eyeing a nervous bear who had suddenly spotted her and was now trying to edge away nonchalantly. Yes? 
You meant to tread on that crack so that I have to thump some poor creature's only fault is wanting to tear you limb from limb. I was just skipping. Quite. Real children don't go hoppity skip unless they are on drugs. He grinned at her. If I catch you being twee again, I will knock your arms behind your head, said Susan levelly. He nodded and went to push Twyla off the swings. Susan relaxed, satisfied. It was her personal discovery. Ridiculous threats didn't worry them at all, but they were obeyed. Especially the ones in graphic detail. The previous governess had used various monsters and boogeymen as a form of discipline. There was always something waiting to eat or carry off bad boys and girls for crimes like stuttering or defiantly and ingratiatingly persisting in writing with their left hand. There was always a scissor man waiting for a little girl who sucked her thumb. Always a boogeyman in the cellar of such bricks as the innocence of childhood constructed. <coughs> Susan's attempts at getting them to disbelieve in the things only caused the problem to get worse. Twyla had started to wet the bed. This may have been a crude form of defense against the terrible clawed creature that was she was certain lived under it. Susan had found out about this one the first night when the child had woken up crying because of a boogeyman in the closet. She'd sighed and gone to have a look. She'd been so angry that she'd pull it out, hit it over the head with the nursery poker, dislocated its shoulder as a means of emphasis, and kicked it out the back door. <laughs> The children refused to disbelieve in monsters because, frankly, they knew damn well the things were there. But Seed found that they could also very firmly believe in the poker. Now, she sat down on a bench and read a book. She made a point of taking the children every day somewhere where they could meet others of the same age. If they got the hang of the playground, she thought, adult life would hold no fears. Besides, it was nice to hear the voice of little children at play, providing you took care to be far enough away not to hear what they were actually saying. I, I worked with kids all through high school and college. I lifeguarded and taught swimming lessons. Accurate. Very accurate. There were lessons later on. Those were going a lot better now that she would gotten rid of the reading books about bouncing balls and dogs called Spot. she would got Gawain on the, the military campaigns of General Tacticus, which were suitably bloodthirsty, but more importantly considered too difficult for a child. As a result, his vocabulary was doubling every week, and he could already use words like disemboweled in everyday conversation. After all, what was the point of teaching children to be children? They were naturally good at it. And she was, to her mild horror, naturally good with them. She wondered suspiciously if this was a family trait. And if to judge by the way her hair so readily knotted itself into a prim bun, she was destined for jobs like this for the rest of her life. It was her parents' fault. They hadn't meant it to turn out like this, at least. She hoped, she hoped charitably that they hadn't. They'd wanted to protect her, to keep her away from the worlds outside of this one, from what people thought of as the occult. From, well, from her grandfather, to put it bluntly. This had, she felt, left her a little twisted up. Of course, to be fair, that was a parent's job. The world was so full of sharp bends that if they didn't put a few twists in you, you wouldn't stand a chance of fitting in. And they'd been conscientious and kind and given her a good home and even an education. It had been a good education, too. But it had only been later on that she realized that it had been an education in, well, education. It meant that if ever anyone needed to calculate the volume of a cone, they could confidently call on Susan Stew Hellet. Anyone at a loss to recall the campaigns of General Tacticus? or the square root of 27.4 would not find her wanting. He needed someone who could talk about household items and things to buy in the shops in five languages. Then Susan was at the head of the queue. Education had been easy. Learning things had been harder. Getting an education was a bit like a communicable sexual disease. 
it made you unsuitable for a lot of the jobs, and then you have the urge to pass it on. So you become a governess. It was one of the few jobs a known lady could do, and she'd taken to it well. She'd sworn that if she did indeed ever find herself dancing on rooftops with chimney sweeps, she'd beat herself to death with her own umbrella. After tea, she read them a story. They liked her stories. The one in the book was pretty awful, but the Susan version was well received. She translated as she read. And then, Jack and then Jack chopped down the beanstalk, adding murder and ecological vandalism to the theft, enticement, and trespass charges already mentioned. But he got away with it and lived happily ever after without so much as a guilty twins about what he had done. Which proves that you can be excused just about anything if you're a hero because no one asks inconvenient questions. So he closed the book with a snap. It's time for bed. The previous governess had taught them a prayer which included the hope that some god or other would take their soul if they died while they were asleep. And if Susan was any judge, had the underlying message that this would be a good thing. One day, Susan revered she'd hunt that woman down. Susan, said Twyla from somewhere under the blankets. Yes. You know last week we wrote letters to the Hogfather? Yes. Only in the park. Rachel says he doesn't exist and it's your father, really. And everyone else says he was right. There was a rustle from the other bed. Twyla's brother had turned over and was listening surreptitiously. Oh dear, thought Susan. She had hoped she could avoid this. Oh, it was going to be like that business with the soul cake duck all over again. Does it matter if you get the presents anyway? She said, making a direct appeal to greed. Yes. Oh dear, oh dear. Susan sat down on the bed, wondering how the hell to get through this. She patted the one visible hand. It's the long one, I'm gonna need water. Look at it this way then, she said, and took a deep mental breath. Wherever people are obtuse and absurd, and wherever they have, by even the most generous standards, the attention span of a small chicken in a hurricane, and the investigative ability of a one-legged cockroach, and wherever people are inanely credulous, pathetically attached to the certainties of the nursery, and in general have as much grasp on the realities of the physical universe as an oyster has of mountaineering, then yes, Twyla, there is a hog father. There was silence from under the bedclothes, but she sensed that the tone of voice had worked. The words had meant nothing. That, as her grandfather might have said, was humanity all over. Good night. Good night, said Susan. It wasn't even a bar. It was just a room where people drank while they waited for other people with whom they had business. The business usually involved the transfer of ownership of something from one person to another. But then, what business doesn't? Five businessmen sat round the table, lit by a candle stuck in a saucer. There was an open bottle between them, and they were taking some care to keep it away from the candle flame. It's gone six, said one, a huge man with dreadlocks and a beard you could keep goats in. The clock struck ages ago. He ain't coming. Let's go. Sit down, will ya? Assassins are always late, cause of style, right? This one's mental, eccentric. What's the difference? A bag of cash. The three that hadn't spoken yet looked at one another. What's this? You never said he was an assassin, said Chicken Wire. You never said the guy was an assassin, did he, Banzo? There was a sound like distant thunder. It was Banzo Lily Wright. Lily White, clearing his throat. That's right, said a voice from the ever slopes. You's never said. The others waited until the rumble died away. Even Banzo's voice halted. He's, the first speaker waved his hands vaguely, trying to get the point across the point that someone was a hamper of food, several folding chairs, 
tablecloth, an assortment of cooking gear, an entire quality van, sort of a picnic, mental. And he's got a funny eye. It's just glass, all right? So the one known as Cat's Eye, signaling the waiter for four beers and a glass of milk. And he's paying $10,000 each. I don't care what kind of eye he's got. I heard it was the maids made of the same stuff they made them fortune telling cookies out of. You can't tell me that's right. And he looks at you with it, said the first speaker. He was known as Peachy, although no one ever found out why. Peachy was not someone you generally asked questions of, except the sorts that go like, if, 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 I, if I give you all my money, could you possibly not break the other leg? Thank you so much. Cat's eye sighed. Certainly there was something odd about Mr. Tateme, but there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. But there's something weird about all assassins, and the man paid well. Lots of assassins used informers and locksmiths. It was against the rules technically, but standards were going down everywhere, weren't they? Usually they paid you late and sparsely as if they were doing the favor. But that it was okay. True, after a few minutes talking to him, your eyes began to water and you felt you needed to scrub your skin even on the inside. But, hey, no one was perfect, were they? Peachy leaned forward. You know what? He said, I reckon you could be here already, in the skies, laughing at us. Well, if he's in here laughing at us, he cracked his knuckles. Medium Dave Lilywhite. The last of the five looked around. There were indeed a number of solitary figures in the low, dark room. Most of them wore cloaks with big hoods. They sat alone in corners, hidden by the hoods. None of them looked very friendly. Don't be daft, Peachy, Cat's Eye murmured. That's the sort of thing they do, Peachy insisted. They're masters of the skies. With that eye of his, that guy sitting by the fire has got an eye patch, said Medium Dave. Medium Dave didn't speak much. He watched a lot. The others turned to stare. He'll wait till we're off guard and go, Aha! said Peachy. They can't kill you unless it's for money, said Cat's Eye. But now there was a suspicion of doubt in his voice. They kept their eyes on the hooded man. He kept his eye on them. If asked to describe what they did for a living, the five men around the table would have said something like, eh, this and that, or the best I can. Although in Banzer's case, he'd have probably said, Durr. they were, by the standards of an on-caring society, criminals. Although they wouldn't have thought of themselves like that. And couldn't even spell words like nefarious. What they generally did was move things around. Sometimes the things were on the wrong side of a steel door, say, or in the wrong house. Sometimes the things were, in fact, people who were far too unimportant to trouble the Assassin's Guild with, but who were nonetheless inconveniently positioned where they were and could much better be located on, for example, a seabed somewhere. None of the five belonged to any formal guild and they generally found their clients. Among those people who, for their own dark reasons didn't want to put the guilds to any trouble. Sometimes because they were guild members themselves, they had plenty of work. There was always something that needed transferring from A to B, or of course, to the bottom of the sea. Any minute now, said Peachy, as the waiter brought their beers. Banzo cleared his throat. This was a sign that another thought had arrived. What I don't understand, he said, is, yes, said his brother. What I don't understand is, how long has this place had waiters? Good evening, said Tateme, putting down the tray. They stared at him in silence. He gave them a friendly smile. Peach's hand slapped the table. You crept up on us, you, he began. Men in their line of work line of business, develop a certain prescience. Medium Dave and Cat's Eye, who were sitting on either side of Pete's leaned away nonchalantly. Hi, said Tateme. 
there was a blur and a knife suttered in the table between Peachy's bum and index finger. He looked down at it in horror. My name's Tateme, said Tateme. Which one are you? Peachy, said Peachy, still staring at the vibrating knife. That's an interesting name, said Tateme. Why are you called Peachy, Peachy? Medium Dave coughed. Peachy looked up into Tateme's face. The glass eye was a mere ball of faintly growing gray. The other eye was a little dot in a sea of white. Peachy's only contact with intelligence had been to beat it up and rob it whenever possible. But a sudden sense of self-preservation glued him to his chair. Because I don't save, he said. Peachy don't like blades, mister, said Cat's Eye. And do you have lots of friends, Peachy? said Tia Timmy. Got a few, yeah. With a sudden whirl of movement that made the men start, Tateme spun away, grabbed the chair, swung it up to the table, and sat down on it. Three of them had already got their hands on their swords. I don't have many, he said apologetically. Don't seem to have the knack. On the other hand, I don't seem to have any enemies at all. Not one. Isn't that nice? Tateme had been thinking, and the crackling, buzzing firework display that was his head. What he was had been thinking about was immortality. He might have been quite insane, but he was no fool. There were in the Assassin's Guild a number of paintings and busts of famous members who had in the past put... No, of course, that, that wasn't right. There were paintings and busts of the famous clients of members with a noticeably modest brass plaque screwed somewhere nearby, bearing some a little, an unassuming little comment like, The part of this veil of tears on Groon Third, Year of the Sideways Leech, the assistance of the Honorable K.W. Dobson Viper House. Many fine old educational establishments had dignified memorials in some hall, Listing the whole, listing the uh, whole old boys who had laid down their lives for monarch and country. The guilds was very similar, except for the question of whose life had been laid. Every guild member wanted to be up there somewhere because getting up there represented immortality. And the bigger your client, the more incredibly discreet and restrained would be the little brass plaque, so that everyone couldn't help but notice your name. In fact, if you were very renowned, they wouldn't even have to write down your name at all. The men around the table watched him. It was always hard to know what Banjo was thinking, or even if he was thinking at all. But the other four were thinking along the lines of Bump's little tit, like all assassins, thinks he knows it all. I could take him down one-handed, no trouble. But you hear stories, those eyes give me the creeps. So what's the job, said Chicken Wire? We don't do jobs, said Tateme. We perform services. And the service will earn each of you $10,000. That's a lot more than Phil's Thieves Guild rate, said Medium Dave. I've never liked the Thieves Guild, said Tateme, without turning his head. Why not? They ask too many questions. We, we don't ask questions, said Chicken Wire quickly. We shall suit one another perfectly, said Tateme. Do have another drink while we wait for the other members of our little troop. Chicken Wire saw Medium Dave's lips start to frame the opening letters. Who? Those, those letters he deemed inauspicious at this time. He kicked Medium Dave's leg under the table. The door opened slightly. A figure came in, but only just. It had inserted itself in the gap and sit along the wall in a manner calculated not to attract attention. Calculated, that is, by someone not good at this sort of calculation. Looked at them over its turned-up collar. That's a wizard, said Peachy. The figure hurried over and dragged up a chair. No, I'm not, it hissed. I'm incognito. Right, Mr. Nito, said Medium Dave. You're just someone in a pointy hat. This is my brother Banzo. That's Peachy. This is Chick. The wizard looked desperately at Tateme. I didn't want to come. Mr. Sidney here is indeed a wizard, said Tateme. A student, anyway. 
but down on his luck at the moment, hence his willingness to join us on this venture. Exactly how far down on his luck, said Medium Dave. The wizard tried not to meet anyone's gaze. I made a misjudgment to do with a wager, he said. Lost a bet, you mean, said Chicken Wire. I paid up on time, said Sydney. Yes, but Chrysopras the troll has this odd little thing about money that turns into lead the next day. Said Tateme cheerfully. So our friend needs to earn a little cast in a hurry and in a climate where arms and legs stay on. No one said anything about there being magic in this, said Peachy. Our destination is probably, think of it as something like a uh, wizard's tower, gentlemen, said Tateme. It isn't an actual wizard's tower, is it, said Medium Dave. They got a very odd sense of humor when it comes to booby traps. No. Guards? I believe so, according to legend, but nothing very much. Medium Dave narrowed his eyes. There's valuable stuff in this tower? Oh, yes. Why ain't there more guards, then? Many guards, then? The person who owns the property probably does not realize the value of what, of what they have. Locks, said Medium Dave. On our way, we shall be picking up a locksmith. Who? Mr. Brown. They nodded. Everyone, at least everyone in the business. And everyone in the business knew what the business was. And if you didn't know what the business was, you weren't a businessman. Knew Mr. Brown. His presence anywhere around the job gave it a certain kind of respectability. He was a neat elderly man who had invented most of the tools in his big leather bag. No matter what cunning you use to get into a place or overcome a small army or find the secret treasure room, sooner or later you sent for Mr. Brown who turn up with his little bag and his little springy things and his little bottles of strange alchemy and his neat little boots. And he'd do nothing for 10 minutes but look at the lock. Then he'd select a piece of bent metal from a ring of several hundred almost identical pieces. And under an hour later, he'd be walking away with a neat 10% of the takings. Of course, you didn't have to use Mr. Brown's services. You could always opt to spend the rest of your life looking at a locked door. All right, where is this place, said Peachy. Tateme turned around and smiled at him. If I'm paying you, why isn't it me who's asking the questions? Peachy didn't even try to stare at a glass eye this time. A second time. Just want to be prepared, that's all. He mumbled. Good reconnaissance is the essence of, is the essence of a successful operation, said Tateme. He turned and looked up at the bulk that was Banjo and added, What is this? This is Banjo, said Medium Dave, rolling himself a cigarette. Does it do tricks? Time stood still for a moment. The other men looked at Medium Dave. He was known to Ock Morpork, to professional underclass as a thoughtful, patient man. And he considered something of an intellectual because some of his tattoos were spelled right. He was reliable in a tight spot, and above all, he was honest. Because good criminals have to be honest. If he had a fault, it was a tendency to deal out terminal and definitive retribution to anyone who said anything about his brother. If he had a virtue, it was a tendency to pick his time. Medium Dave's fingers tucked the tobacco into the paper and raised it to his lips. No, he said. Chicken Wire tried to defrost the conversation. He's not what you call bright, but he's always useful. He can lift two men in each hand by their necks. You're, said Banjo. He looks like a volcano, said Tian. Really, said Medium Dave Lily White. Chicken Wire reached out hastily and pushed him back down in his seat. Tateme turned and smiled at him. I do so hope we're going to be friends, Mr. Medium Dave, he said. It really hurts to think I might not be among friends. He gave him another bright smile. Then he turned back to the table. Are we resolved, gentlemen? They nodded. There was some reluctance given the consensus view that Tateme belonged in a room with soft walls. But $10,000 was $10,000. Possibly even more. Good, said Tateme. He looked Banjo up and down. 
then I suppose we might as well make a start. And he hit Banzo very hard in the mouth. Okay, I've been reading for over an hour. I'm gonna step away for a minute, grab some water, be right back. <laughs> You don't realize how uh, wordy Jerry Pratchett is until you try and read it all out loud. Oh, well, we're near where I'm planning on stopping. Death in person did not turn up upon the cessation of every life. It was not necessary. Governance, go governments govern, but prime ministers and presidents do not personally turn up in people's homes to tell them how to run their lives because of the mortal danger this would present. There are laws instead. But from time to time, Def checked up and checked up to see if things were functioning properly or to put it another way and more accurate way, properly ceasing to function in the less significant areas of his jurisdiction. And now he walked through dark seas. Silt rose in clouds around his feet as he strode along the trench bottom. His robes floated out around him. There was silence, pressure, and utter, utter darkness. But there was life down here, even this far below the waves. There were giant squid and lobsters with teeth on their eyelids. There were spidery things with their stomachs on their feet and fish that made their own light. It was a quiet, black, nightmare world. But life lives everywhere that life can. Where life can't, this takes a little longer. Death's destination was a slight rise in the trench floor. Already the water around him was getting warmer and more populated by creatures that looked as though they'd put together from the bits left over from everything else. Unseen, but felt, a vast column of scalding hot water was welling up from a fissure. Somewhere below were rocks heated to near incandescence by the disk's magical field. Spires of minerals have been deposited around this vent, and in this tiny oasis a type of life had grown up. It did not need air or light, did not even need food in the way that most other species would understand the term. It just grew at the edge of the streaming column of water, looking like a cross between a worm and a flower. Death kneeled down and peered at it. Because it was so small, but for some reason, in this world without eyes or light, it was also a brilliant red. The profligacy of life in these matters never ceased to amaze him. He reached inside his robe and pulled out a small roll of black material, like a jeweler's toolkit. With great care, he took from one of its pouches a scythe about an inch long and held it expertly between thumb and forefinger. Somewhere overhead, a sard of rock was dislodged by a stray current and tumbled down, raising little puffs of silt as it bounced off the tubes. It landed just beside the living flower and then rolled rinsing it from the rock. Death flicked the tiny scythe just as the bloom faded. The omnipotent eyesight of various supernatural entities is often remarked upon. It is said they can see the fall of every sparrow. And this may be true, but there's only one who is always there when it hits the ground. The soul of the tube worm was very small and uncomplicated. 
It wasn't bothered about sin. It had never coveted its neighbor's polyps. It had never gambled or drunk strong liquor. It never bothered itself with questions like, why am I here? Because it had no conception at all of here, or for that matter, of I. Nevertheless, something was cut free under the surgical heads of the scythe and vanished in the rolling water. Death carefully put the instrument away and stood up. All was well. Things were functioning satisfactorily, and... But they weren't. In the same way that the best of engineers can hear the tiny change that signals a bearing going bad, long before the finest of instruments would detect anything wrong, Death picked up a discord in the symphony of the world. It was one wrong note among billions, but all the more noticeable for that. Like a tiny pebble in a very large shoe. He waved a finger in the waters. For a moment a blue door-shaped outline appeared. He stepped through it and was gone. The two creatures didn't notice him go. They hadn't noticed him arrive. They never ever noticed anything. I'm only on page 56. A cart trundled through the freezing, foggy streets. The driver hunched in his seat. He seemed to be all thick brown overcoat. A figure darted out of the swirls and was suddenly on the box next to him. Hi, it said. My name's Ted Temme. What's yours? Here you get down. I ain't allowed to give lit. The driver stopped. It was amazing how Ted Temme had been able to thrust a knife through four layers of frick clothing and stop it just at the point where it pricked at the flesh. Sorry, said Ted Temme, smiling brightly. Er, there ain't nothing valuable, you know, nothing valuable. Only a few bags of... Oh dear, said Ted Temme. His face a sudden acre of concern. Well, let's start to see, won't we? What is your name, sir? Ernie, er, Ernie, said Ernie. Yes, Ernie, er... Ted Temme turned his head slightly. Come along, gentlemen. This is my friend Ernie. He's going to be our driver for tonight. Ernie saw half a dozen figures emerge from the fog and climb into the cart behind him. He didn't turn to look at them. By the prickling of his kidneys, he knew this would not be an exemplary career move. But it seemed that one of the figures, a huge sampling mound of a creature, was carrying a long bundle over its shoulders. The bundle moved and made muffled noises. Do stop shaking, Ernie. We just need a lift, said Teteme as the cart rumbled over the cobbles. Where to, mister? Oh, we don't mind, but first I'd like you to stop in Sadler Square, Square, near the second fountain. The knife was withdrawn. Ernie stopped trying to breathe through his ears. Er, what is it? You do seem tense, Ernie. I always find a neck massage helps. I ain't rightly allowed to carry passengers. See, Charlie will give me a right telling off. Oh, don't you worry about that, Teteme. We're all friends here. What are we bringing the girl for, said a voice behind him. It's not right, hitting girls, said a deep voice. Our ma'am said no hitting girls. Only bad boys do that. Our ma'am said... You be quiet, Banjo. Our ma'am said... Shh. Ernie here doesn't want to listen to our troubles, said Teteme. Not taking his gaze off the driver. Me? Death is opposed, me. Burble Ernie, who in some ways was a very quick learner. Can't hardly see more than four few feet neater. Got no recollection from the face that I do see comes to that. Bad memory. Ha! Talk about bad memory. Course, sometimes I can Course, sometimes I can be like as it were on the car. Talking to people, ha! Just like I'm talking to you now. And then when they're gone, ha! <laughs> try as I might. Do you think I can remember anything about them or how many there were, or what they were carrying, or anything about any girl or anything? By the time his voice was a high pitched wheeze, ha! Sometimes I forget my own name. It's Ernie, isn't it? Said Tetame, giving him a happy smile. Ah, and here we are. Oh dear, there seems to be some excitement. There was the sound of fighting somewhere ahead, and then a couple of masked trolls ran past with three watchmen after them. They all ignored the cart. I heard the debris gang were going to have a go at Packley Strongham tonight, said a voice behind Ernie. Looks like Mr. Brown won't be joining us then, said another voice. There was a snigger. Oh, I don't know about that, Mr. Lily White. I don't know about that at all, said a third voice. And this one was from the direction of the fountain. Should you take my bag while I climb up? Please do be careful. It's a little heavy. 
it was a neat little voice, the owner of a voice that kept his money in a shovel purse and always counted his change carefully. Ernie thought all this and then tried very hard to forget that he had. On you go, Ernie. Round behind the university, I think. As the cart rolled on, the neat little voice said, You grab all the money and didn't get out very smartly, am I right? There's a murmur of agreement. Learned that on my mother's knee, yeah. You learned a lot of stuff across your ma's knee, Mr. Lillywhite. Don't you say nothing but a ma'am. The voice was like an earthquake. This is Mr. Brown, Banjo. You smarten up. You didn't know what to talk about our ma'am. <laughs> all right, all right. Hello, Banjo. I think I may have a suite somewhere. Yes, there you are. Yes, your ma knew the way, all right. You go in quietly, you take your time, you get what you came for, and you leave smartly and in good order. You don't hang around the scene to count it and tell one another what brave lads you are. Am I right? You seem to done all, have done all right, Mr. Brown. The cart rattled towards the other side of the square. Just a little for expenses, Mr. Cat's Eye. A little hog's watch present, you might say. Never take the lot and run. Take a little and walk. Dress neat. That's my model. Dress neat and walk away slowly. Never run. Never run. The Watts will always chase a running man. They're like terriers for giving chase. No, you walk out slow. You walk around the corner. You wait till there's a lot of excitement. Then you turn around and walk back. They can't cope with that, see? Half the time, they'll stand aside to let you walk past. Good evening, officers, you say? And then you go home for your tea. We get you out of trouble. I can see that if you got the nerve. Oh, no, Mr. Peach. He doesn't get you out of keeps you out of. It was like a very good school room Ernie fought and immediately tried to forget, or a backstreet gym when a champion prize fighter had just strolled in. What's up with your mouth, Banjo? He lost a tooth, Mr. Brown, said another voice in the singer. Lost a tooth, Mr. Brown, said the funder that was Banjo. Keep your eyes on the road, Ernie, said Tia Tame, beside him. We don't want an accident, do we? The road here was deserted. Despite the bundle of the city, the bustle of the city behind them, and the bulk of the universe in nearby, there were a few streets, but the buildings were abandoned, and something was happening to the sound. The rest of Ankh Morpork seemed very far away. The sounds is writhing as if through quite a thick wall. They were entering that scorned little corner of Ankh Morpork that had long been the site of the university's rubbish pitch, and it was now known as the On Real Estate. Bloody wizards, muttered Ernie automatically. I beg your pardon, said Tia Timmy. My great-grandpa said we used to own property around here. Low levels of magic, my arse. Ha! It's all right for them wizards. They got all kinds of spells to protect them. Bit of magic here, bit of magic there. Stands to reason it's got to go somewhere, right? There used to be warning signs up, said the neat voice from behind. Yeah, well, warning signs knock more pork. Might as well good firewood written on them. Said someone else. I mean, stands to reason. They check out an old spell for exploding this, another one for twiddling that, another one for making carrots grow. They finish up interfering with one another. Who knows what they'll end up doing, said Ernie. Great Grandpa said sometimes they'd wake up in the morning and the cellar would be higher than the attic. And that weren't the worst, he added darkly. Yeah, I heard where it got so bad you could walk down the street and meet yourself coming the other way, someone supplied. Got so you didn't know what, it was bum or breakfast time, I heard. The dog used to bring home all kinds of stuff, said Ernie. Great-grandpa said half the time they used to die behind the sofa. It came in with something in its mouth. Corroded fire spells started to fizz, broken wands with green smoke coming out of them, and I don't know what else. If you saw a cat playing with anything, it was best not to try to find what it, out what it was, I can tell you. He twists the reins, his current predicament almost gotten the tide of hereditary resentment. I mean, they say all the old spell books and stuff was buried deep and they recycle the used spells now. That don't seem much comfort when your potatoes start walking about, he grumbled. My great-grandpa went to see the head wizard about it and he said, he put on a strangled nasal voice, which was his idea of how you talk when you got an education. Oh, there might be some temporary inconvenience now, my good man. But just you come back in 50,000 years, bloody wizards. The horse turned a corner. This was a dead-end street. 
half collapsed houses, windows smashed, doors stolen, leaned against one another on either side. I heard they said they were going to clean up this place and someone, oh yeah, Ernie, said Ernie and spat when it hit the ground, they ran away. And you know what? You got loonies coming in all the time now, poking, poking around, pulling things about. Just at the wall up ahead, said T. Tommy, conversationally. I think you generally go through just where there's a pile of rubble by the old dead tree. Although you wouldn't see it unless you look closely, but I've never seen how you do it. Er, I can't take you through, you lot through, said Ernie. This is one thing, but not taking people through. Tatame sighed, and we're getting on so well. Listen, Ernie, er, you will take us through, or, and I say this with very considerable regret, I will have to kill you. You seem a nice man, conscientious, a very serious overcoat, and sensible boots. But if I take you through, what's the worst that can happen? Said Tedhame. You'll lose your job, whereas if you don't, you'll die. So if we look at it like that, we're actually doing you a favor. Oh, do say yes. Er, Ernie's brain felt twisted up. The lad was definitely what Ernie thought of as a toff, but he seemed nice and friendly, but it didn't all add it up. The tone and the content didn't match. Besides, said T. Tim, if you've been coerced, it's not your fault, is it? No one can blame you. No one can blame anyone who's been coerced at knife, knife point. Oh, well, I suppose if we're talking coerced, Ernie muttered, going along with things seemed to be the only way. The horse stopped and stood, waiting with the patient look of an animal that probably knows the route better than the driver. Ernie fumbled in his overcoat pocket and took out a small ten, rather like a snuff box. He opened it. There was glowing dust inside. What do you do with that, said Titeme? All interest? Oh, you just take a pence and throws it in the air and it goes twing and it opens the soft place. So you don't need any special training or anything? Or you just chucks it on the wall there and it goes twing, said Ernie. Really, may I try? I'm finding it very, very hard to feel bad about what's going to happen next. Tatame took the tin from his unresisting hand and threw a pinch of dust into the air in front of the horse. It hovered for a moment and then produced a narrow, glittering arts in the air. It sparkled and went twing! Aw, oh, said a voice behind, behind him. Isn't that nice, eh, R. Davy? Yeah. All oh, pretty sparkles. And then you just drive forward, T. Tommy? That's right, said Ernie. Quick mind. It only stays open for a little while. T. Tommy pocketed the little tin. Thank you very much, Ernie. Very much indeed. His other hand lashed out. There was a glint of metal. The carter blinked and then fell sideways off his seat. There was silence from behind, tinted with horror and possibly just a little terrible admiration. Wasn't he dull, said Tia Teme, picking up the reins. Tia Teme spoke up. <laughs> Snow began to fall. It fell on the recumbent shape of Ernie, and it also fell through several hooded gray robes that hung in the air. There appeared to be nothing inside them. You could believe they were there merely to make a certain point in space. Well, said one, we are frankly impressed. Indeed, said another, we would never have thought of doing it this way. He is certainly a resourceful human, said a third. The beauty of it all, said the first, or it may have been the second, because absolutely nothing distinguished the robes is that there is so much else we can control, we will control. Quite, said another, it's really amazing how they think. A sort of illogical logic. Children, said another, who would have thought it? But today the children, tomorrow the world. Give me a child until he is seven and he's mine for life, said another. There is a dreadful pause. The consensus beings that called themselves the auditors did not believe in anything 
except possibly immortality. And the way to be immortal, they knew, was to avoid living. Most of all, they did not believe in personality. To be a personality was to be a creature of a beginning and an end. And since they reasoned that in an infinite universe, any life was by comparison unimaginably short, they died instantly. There was a flaw in their logic, of course, but by the time they find, found this out, it was always too late. In the meantime, they scrupulously avoided any comment, action, or experience that set them apart. You said me, said one. Ah, yes, but you see we were quoting, said the other one hurriedly. Some religious person said that about educating children, and so would logically say me, but I wouldn't say that term of myself and of damn. The robe vanished in a little puff of smoke. Oh, God, I love this. Let that be a lesson to us, said one of the survivors as another and totally indistinguishable robe popped into existence where the stricken colleague had been. Yes, said the newcomer. Well, it certainly appears. It stopped. A dark shape was approaching through the snow. It's him, it said. They faded hurriedly, not simply vanishing, but spreading out and thinning until they were just lost in the background. The dark figure stopped by the dead Carter and reached down. Could I give you a hand? Ernie looked up. Court, yeah, he said. Got to his feet, swaying a little. Here, your fingers are cold, mister. Sorry. What did he go and do that for? I did what he said. He could have killed me. Ernie felt inside his overcoat and pulled out a small... And at this point, strangely transparent silver flask. I always keep a nip on me these cold nights, he said. Keep some spirits up. Yes, indeed. Death looked around briefly and sniffed the air. How am I going to explain all this then, eh? Said Ernie, taking a puff. Sorry, that was very rude of me. I wasn't paying attention. I said, what am I going to tell people? Letting some blokes ride off my cart, neat as you like. That's going to be the sack for sure. I'm going to be in big trouble, I tell you what. Ah, well, there at least I have some good news, Ernest. And then again, I have some rather bad news. Ernie listened. Once or twice, he looked at the corpse at his feet. He looked smaller from the outside. He was bright enough not to argue. Some things are fairly obvious when it's a seven-foot skeleton with a scythe telling you them. So I'm dead then, he concluded. Correct. Er, the priest said that, you know, after you're dead, it's like going through a door and on one side of it there's, he, well, a terrible place. Death looked at his worried, fading face. Through a door. That's what he said. I expect it depends on the direction you're walking in. When the street was empty again, except for the fleshy abode of the late Ernie, the gray sapes came back into focus. Honestly, he gets worse and worse, said one. He was looking for us, said another. Did you notice? He suspects something. He gets so concerned about things. Yes, but the beauty of this plan, said a third, is that he can't interfere. He can go everywhere, said one. No, said another, not quite everywhere. And when and with ineffable snugness, they faded into the foreground. It started to snow quite heavily. I think I'm doing the same voice for the uh, the auditors and death. Gonna need to work on that for the next one, I think. I need to go really deep with death and I've been reading for an hour and a half. It was the night before Hogswatts all through the house. One creature stirred. It was a mouse. And someone in the face of all appropriateness had baited a trap, although because it was the festive season they'd used a piece of pork crackling. 
The smell of it had been driving the most mad all day, but now with no one about it, it was prepared to risk it. The mouse didn't know it was a trap. Mice aren't good at passing on information. Young mice aren't taking up the famous trap sites and told, this is where your Uncle Arthur passed away. All knew was that, what the hey? Here was something to eat on a wooden board with some wire around it. A brief scurry later and its jaw had closed on the rind, or rather passed through it. The mouse looked around at what was now lying under the big spring and thought, oops. Then its gaze went up to the black clad figure, black clad figure that had faded into view by the wainscoting. Squeak, it asked. Squeak, said the deaf of rats. And that was it, more or less. Afterwards, the deaf of rats looked around with interest. In the nature of things, his very important job tended to take him to rick yards and dank cellars, and the inside of cats and all the little dank holes where rats and mice finally found out there was a promised cheese. This place was different. It was brightly decorated for one thing. Ivy and mistletoe hung in bunches from the bookshelves. Brightly colored streamers festened the walls, a feature seldom found in most holes, or even quite civilized cats. The death of rats took a leap onto a chair and from there onto the table, and in fact, right into a glass of amber liquid, which tipped over and broke. A puddle spread around four turnips and began to soak into a note which had been written rather awkwardly on pink writing paper. It read, Dear Hogfather, for Hogswats, I would like a drum on a dolly, on a drum and a dolly and a teddy bear, and a ghostly ominous inquisition in torture chamber with wind up rack and nearly, and nearly real blood. You can use again, you can get it from the toy shop in Short Street. It is five ninety nine pounds. I have been good and here is a glass of sherry and a pork pie for you and turnips for Gouger and Tusker and Rooter and Snowder. I hope the chimney is big enough, but my friend William says you are your father, Willie. Yours, Virginia Prude. He does like actual cursive and I found that a little hard to read, I apologize. <laughs> The death of rats nibbled a bit of the pork pie because when you are a personification of the death of small rodents, you have to behave in certain ways. He also piddled on one of the turnips for the same reason, although only metaphorically, because when you are a small skeleton in a black robe, there are also some things you technically cannot do. Then he leapt down from the table and left sari flavored footprints all the way to the tree that stood in a pot in the corner. It was really only a bare branch of oak, but so much shiny holly and mistletoe had been wired onto it that it gleamed in the light of the candles. There was tinsel on it and glittering ornaments and small bags of chocolate money. The deaf of rats peered at its hugely distorted reflection in a glass ball and then looked up at the mantelpiece. He reached it in one jump, and one jump, and ambled curiously towards the cars that had been ranged along it. His gray whiskers twitched at messages like, "Wishing you joy and all good cheer at Hogswatch time or, and all through the year." A couple of them had pictures of a big, jolly, flat, fat man carrying a sack. In one of them, he was riding in a sled drawn by four enormous pigs. The deaf of rats sniffed at a couple of long stockings that had been hung from the mantelpiece over the fireplace, in which the fire had died down to a few solid asses. He was aware of a subtle tension in the air, a feeling that here was a scene that was also a stage. A round hole, as it were, waiting for a round peg. There was a scraping noise. A few lumps of soot thumped into the asses. The grim squeaker nodded to himself. The scraping became louder and was followed by a moment of silence and then a clang as something landed in the ashes and knocked over a set of ornamental fire irons. 
the rat watched carefully as a red-robed figure pulled itself upright and staggered across the hearth rug, rubbing its sin where it had been caught by the toasting fork. It reached the table and read the note. The deaf of rats thought he heard a groan. The turnips were pocketed and so, to the deaf of rats' annoyance, was the pork pie. He was pretty sure it was to be eaten here, not taken away. The figure scanned the dripping note for a moment and then turned around and approached the mantelpiece. The deaf of rats pulled back slightly behind. Season's greetings. A red gloved hand took down a stocking. There was some creaking and rustling and it was replaced looking a lot fatter. The larger box sticking out of the top had just visible the words victim figures not included, three to ten years. The deaf of rats couldn't see much of the donor of this munificence. The big red hood had it all the face apart from a long white beard. Finally, when the figure finished, it stood back and pulled a list out of its pocket. It held it up, it's, it held it up to the hood and appeared to be consulting it. It waved its other hand vaguely at the fireplace, the sooty footprints, the empty sari glass, and the stocking. Then it bent forward as if reading some tiny print. Ah, yes, it said, er, ho, ho, ho. With that, it ducked down and entered the chimney. There was some scrabbling before its boots gained a purchase, and then it was gone. The deaf of rats realized he'd begun to gnaw his little scythe's handle in sheer shock. Squeak! <laughs> he landed in the ashes and swarmed up the sooty cave of the chimney. He scrambled so fast that he shot out of it, with his legs still scrabbling and landed in the snow on the roof. There was a sledge hovering in the air by the gutter. The red hooded figure had just climbed in and appeared to be talking to someone invisible behind a pile of sacks. Here's another pork pie. And he mustards to the sacks there, a treat with mustard. It does not appear so. Oh well, pass it over anyway. It looks very bad. Nah, just where something's nibble it. I mean the situation. Most of the letters, they don't really believe. They pretend to believe just in case. I fear it may be too late. It has spread so fast and back in time, too. And gonna jump down to an appendices because I like this bit. This is very similar to the succession suggestion put forward by the Quirmian philosopher Ventry, who said, possibly the gods exist and possibly they do not. So why not believe in them in any case? If it's all true, you'll go to a lovely place when you die. And if it isn't, then you've lost nothing, right? When he died, he woke up in a circle of gods holding nasty-looking sticks, and one of them said, We're gonna show you what we think of Mr. Clever Dick and these here parts. Never say die, master. That's our motto, eh? Said the sacks, apparently, with their mouths full. I can't say it's ever really been mine. I meant we're not gonna be intimidated by the certain prospect of complete and utter failure, master. Aren't we? Oh, good. Well, I suppose we'd better, bring go better be going. The figure picked up the reins. Up, Gouger. Up, Rooter. Up, Tusker. Up, Snouter. Giddy up! The four large boars harnessed to the sledge did not move. Why doesn't that work? said the figure in a puzzled, heavy voice. Beats me, master, said the sacks. It works on horses. You could try pig hooey. Pig hooey. They waited. No. No, doesn't seem to reach them. There was some whispering. Really? You think that would work? It bloody well work on me if I was a pig master. Very well then. The figure gathered up its ra the reins again. Apple sauce. The pig's legs blurred, silver light flickered across them, and expanded outwards. They dwindled to a dot and vanished. Squeak! 
The death of rats skipped across the snow, slid down a drain pipe, and landed on the roof of a shed. There was a raven perched there, staring disconsolately at something. Squeak. Look at that, will you? said the raven rhetorically. And waved the claw at a bird table in the garden below. They hangs up half a bloody coconut, a lump of bacon rind, a handful of peanuts, and a bit of wire, and they think they're God's gift to the natural world. Huh? Do I see eyeballs? Do I see entrails? I think not. Most intelligent bird in the temperate latitudes, and I get and I get the cold solar just because I can't hang upside down and go tweet, tweet, tweet. Look at Robins now, stroppy little evil bugglers. Fight like demons, but all they gotta do is go bop, bop, bopping along. And they can't move for bird crumbs, whereas me, myself, can repite poems or repeat many humorous phrases. Squeak. Yes, what? The death of rats pointed at the roof and then the sky and jumped up and down excitedly. The raven shriveled one eye upwards. Oh yes, him, he said. Turns up this time of year. Tends to be associated distantly with robins, which squeak, squeak, eek, eek. The death of rats pantomimed a figure landing in a grate and walking around the room. Squeak, eek, 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 squeak, eek, 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 eek squeak. Oh, that's hurting my throat. <laughs> Been overdoing the hogs watch cheer, have you? Been rooting around the brandy butter? Squeak. The raven's, eye, the raven's eyes revolt. Look, death's death. It's a full-time job, right? It's not as though you can run like a, a window cleaning round on the side. Or nip around after work cutting people's lawn. Squeak. Oh, please yourself. The raven crouched a little to allow the tiny figure to hop up onto its back and then lumbered into the air. Of course, they can't go mental, you recall, types, it said as it swooped over the moonlight garden. Look at old man trouble for one. A squeak! Oh, I'm not suggesting. Susan didn't like the beers, didn't like beers, but she went there anyway, when the pressures of being normal got too much. Beers, despite the smell and the drink in the company, had one important virtue. In beers, no one took notice of anything. Hogswatch was traditionally supposed to be a time for families. But the people who drank in beers probably didn't have families. Some of them looked as though they might have had litters or clutches. Some looked as though they'd eaten their relatives, or at least someone's relatives. Byers was where the undead drank, and when Eager the barman was asked for a Bloody Mary, he didn't mix a metaphor. The regular customers didn't ask questions, and not only because some of them found anything above a growl hard to articulate. None of them was in the answers business. Everyone in buyers drank alone, even when they were in groups or packs. Despite the decorations put up inexpertly by Igor the barman to show Rilling, buyers was not a family place. Family was a subject Susan liked to avoid. Currently, she was being aided in this by a gin and tonic. In buyers, unless you weren't choosy, it paid to order a drink that was transparent because Eager also had undirected ideas about what you could stick on the end of a cocktail stick. If you saw something spherical and green, you just had to hope that it was an olive. So you felt hot breath on her ear. On her ear. A boogeyman had sat down on the stool beside her. What's the normo doing in a place like this then? It rumbled, causing a glass of vaporized alcohol and halitosis to engulf her. Ha, you think it's cool coming down over here and swanning around in the black dress with all the lost boys, eh? Dabbling in a bit of the designer darkness, eh? Susan moved her stool away a little, the boogeyman grinned. Want a boogeyman under your bed, eh? Now then, Slamazel, said Eager, without looking up from pausing the grass. But what's he down here for, eh? said the boogeyman. 
huge hairy hand grabs Susan's arm. Of course, maybe what he wants is, I ain't telling you again, Slamazel. He saw the girl turn to face Slamazel. Igor wasn't in a position to see her face fully, but the boogeyman was. He shot back so quickly that he fell off his stool. And when the girl spoke, what he said was only partly words, but also a statement. Wit written in stone of how the future was going to be. Go away and stop bothering me. So he turned back and gave Igor a plight and a slightly apologetic smile. The boogeyman struggled frantically out of the wreckage of his stool and lopped towards the door. Susan felt the drinkers turn back to their private preoccupations. It was amazing what you could get away with in buyers. Igor put down the glass and looked up at the window. For a drinking den that relied on darkness, it was rather, rather a large one. But of course, some, quest some customers did arrive by air. Something was tap, tap, tapping on it now. Igor lurched over and opened it. Susan looked up. Oh, no. The death of rats leapt down onto the counter with a raven fluttering after it. Squeak, squeak, eek, eek, squeak, eek, 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 squeak. Go away, said Susan coldly. I'm not interested. You're just a figment of my imagination. The raven perched on a bowl behind the bar and said, Ah, great. Squeak. What are these, said the ravens, flicking something off the end of its beak. Onions. Fah. Go on, go away, the pair of you, said Susan. The rat says your granddad's gone mad, said the raven. Says he's pretending to be the hog father. Listen, I just don't... What? Red cloak, long beard. Heek, heek, heek. Going ho, ho, ho. Driving around the big sledge drawn by the four piggies, the whole thing. Pigs? What happened to Binky? Oh, Search me. Of course, it can happen, as I was telling the rat only just now. Susan put her hands over her ears, more for a desperate theatrical effect than for the muffling they gave. I don't want to know. I don't have a grandfather. So he had to hold on to that. The deaf of rats squeaked at length. The rat says you must remember. He's tall, not what you call fleshy. He carries a scythe. Go away and take the, the rat with you. She waved her hand wildly and to her horror and shame knocked the little hooded skeleton over an ashtray. Eek! The raven took the rat's cowl and beak and tried to drag him away. But a tiny skeletal fist shook its, ski its scythe. Eek, 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 squeak! He says, you don't mess with the rat said the raven. In a flurry of wings, they were gone. Igor closed the window. He didn't pass any comment. They weren't real, said Susan hurriedly. Well, that is, the raven's probably real, but he hangs around with the rat, which isn't real, said Igor. That's right, said Susan gratefully. You probably didn't see a thing. That's right, said Igor. Not a thing. Now, how much do I owe you, said Susan? Igor counted on his fingers. That'll be a dollar for the drinks, he said, and five pence because the raven that wasn't here messed in the pickles. It was the night before Hogswatts, and the Arch Chancellor's new bathroom, Moto wiped his hands on a piece of rag and looked proudly at his handiwork. Shining porcelain gleamed back at him, copper and brass shone in the lamplight. He was a little worried that he hadn't been able to test that everything, but Mr. Ridcoli had said, I'll test it when I use it. And Moto never argued with the uh, gentleman, as he thought of them. He knew that they all knew a lot more than he knew and was quite happy knowing this. He didn't meddle with the fabric of time and space, and they kept out of his greenhouses. greenhouses. The way he saw it, it was a partnership. He'd been particularly careful to scrub the floors. Mr. Rickley had been very specific about that. Veruca gnome, he said to himself, giving a tap a last pulse. What an imagination the gentlemen do have. Far off, unheard by anyone, was a faint 
noise like the ring of tiny silver bells. Glingo, glingo, glingo. And someone landed abruptly in a snowdrift and said, Bugger! What's this terrible thing to say is your first word ever? <sighs> okay, I'm gonna... I've got one or two more bits and I'm gonna call it a night. Overhead, heedless of the new and somewhat angry life that was even now dusting itself off, the sledge soared onwards through time and space. I'm finding the beard a bit of a trial, said Def. Why have you got to have the beard, said the voice from among the sacks. I thought you said people see what they expect to see. Children don't. Too often they see what's there. Well, at least it's keeping you in the right frame of mind, master. In character sort of thing. But going down the chimney, where's the sense in that? I can just walk through the walls. Walking through the walls is not right neither, said the voice from the sacks. It works for me. It's got to be the chimneys. Same as the beard, really. A head thrust itself out from the pile. Pierce belongs to the oldest, most unpleasant pixie in the universe. The fact that it was underneath a jolly little green hat with a bell on it did not do anything to improve matters. It waved a crabbed hand containing a thick wad of letters, many of them on pastel-colored paper, often with bunnies and teddy bears on them, and written mostly in crayon. You reckon those little buggers be writing to someone who walked through walls, it said, and the ho, ho, ho could use some more work if you don't mind me saying so. Ho, ho, ho. No, 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 said Albert. You gotta put in a bit of life in it, sir. No offense, it didn't. It's gotta be a big fat laugh. You gotta, you gotta sound like you're pissing brandy and crapping plum pudding, sir. Excuse my clatching. Really, how do you know all this? I was young once, sir. Hung up my stocking like a good boy every year for it to get filled with toys just like you're doing. Mind you, in those days, basically it was sausages and black pudding, if you were lucky. But you always got a pink sugar piglet in the toe. It weren't a good hog's watch unless you'd eaten so much you were sick as a pig, master. Def looked at the sacks. It was a strange but demonstrable fact that the sack of toys carried by the hog father, no matter what they really contained, always appeared to have, sticking at the top, a teddy bear, a toy soldier in the kind of colorful uniform that would stand out in a disco, a drum, and a red and white candy cane. The actual contents always turned out to be something a bit garish and costing $5.99. Def had inv investigated one or two. There had been a real Agassian ninja, for example, with fearsome death grip, and a Captain Carrot, one man night watch, with a complete wardrobe of toy weapons, each of which cost as much as the original wooden doll in the first place. Mind you, the stuff for girls was just as depressing. It seemed to be nearly all horses. Most of them were grinning. Horses, Def felt, shouldn't grin. Any horse that was grinning was planning something. He sighed again. Then there was the business of deciding who'd been naughty or nice. He never had to think about that sort of thing before, naughty or nice. It was ultimately all the same. Still, it had to be done right, otherwise it wouldn't work. The pigs pulled up alongside another chimney. Here we are, said Albert. James Riddle, age eight. Huh, yes, he actually says in his letter, I bet you don't exist because everyone knows it's your parents. Oh, yes, said Def with what almost sounded like sarcasm. I'm sure his parents are just impatient to bang their elbows in 12 feet of narrow, unswept chimney, I don't think. I shall tread extra certain into his carpet. Right, sir. Good thinking. Speaking of wits, down you go, sir. How about if I don't give him anything as a punishment for not believing? Yeah, but what's that going to prove? Death sighed. I suppose you're right. Did you check the list? Yes, twice. Are you sure that's enough? Definitely. Couldn't really make heads or tail of it to tell you the truth. How can I tell if he's been naughty or nice, for example? Oh, well, I don't know, as he hung his clothes up, that sort of thing. 
And if he has been good, I may give him this Clatchian war chair with real spinning sword blades. I want one of those. That's right. And if he's been bad, Albert scratched his head. When I was a lad, you got a bag of bones. It's amazing how kids got better behaved towards the end of the year. Oh dear, and now, Albert held the package up to his ear and ruffled, and rustled it. Sounds like socks. Socks. Could be a woolly vest. Serves him right, if I may venture to express an opinion. Albert looked across the snowy rooftops and sighed. This wasn't right. He was helping because, well, death was his master, and that's all there was to it. And if the master had a heart, it would be in the right place, but... Are you sure we ought to be doing this, master? Death stopped halfway out the chimney. Can you think of a better alternative, Al Albert? And that was it. Albert couldn't. Someone had to do it. There were bears on the street again. Susan ignored them and didn't even make a point of not treading on the cracks. They just stood around, looking a bit puzzled and slightly transparent, visible only to children and Susan. News like Susan gets around. The bears had heard about the poker. Nuts and berries, they're expressing, seems to say. That's what we're here for. Big sharp teeth. What big sharp? Oh, these big sharp teeth. They're just for, um... Cracking nuts, and some of those berries can be really vicious. <laughs> the city's clocks were striking six when she got back to the house. She was allowed her own key. It wasn't as if she was a servant, exactly. You couldn't be a duchess and a servant, but it was all right to be a governess. If you understand that it wasn't exactly what you were, it was merely a way of passing the time until you did what every girl or gal was supposed to do in life, i.e. marry some man. It was understood that you were playing. The parents were in awe of her. She was the daughter of a duke, whereas Mr. Gator was a man to be reckoned with in the wholesale boots and shoes business. Mrs. Gator was bucking for a transfer into the upper classes, which she currently hoped to achieve by reading books on etiquette. She treated Susan with the kind of worried deference she thought was due to anyone who'd known the difference between a serviette and a napkin from birth. Susan had never before come across the idea that you could rise in society by, as it were, gaining marks. Especially since this nobleman, as he'd met in her father's house, had used neither serviette nor napkin, but a state of mind which was, drop it on the floor, dogs will eat it. When Mrs. Gator had tremul tremulously asked her how one addressed the second cousin of a queen, Susan had replied without thinking, we call them Jamie usually. And Mrs. Gator had had to go and have a headache in her room. Mr. Gator just nodded when he met her in a passage and never said very much to her. He was pretty sure he knew where he stood in boots and shoes, and that was that. Gawain and Twyla, and Twyla, who'd been named by people who apparently loved them, <laughs> had been put to bed by the time Susan got in, at their own insistence. It's a widely held belief at a certain age that going to bed early makes tomorrow come faster. So he went to tidy up the schoolroom and get things ready for the morning and began to pick up the things the children had left lying around. Then something tapped at a window pane. So he peered out at the darkness and then opened the window. A drift of snow fell down outside. In the summer, the window opened into the branches of a cherry tree in the winter dark, there were little gray lines where the snow had set along them. Who's that, said Susan. Something hopped through the frozen branches. Tweet, 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 would you believe, said the raven. Not you again. You want to baby some dear little robin? Listen to your grant. Go away. Susan slammed the window and pulled the curtains across. She put her back to them to make sure and tried to concentrate on the room. It helped to think about normal things. There was the Hogswatch tree, a rather smaller version of the grand one in the hall. 
So you'd help the children to make paper decorations for it. Yes, think about that. There were the paper chains. There were the bits of holly thrown out from the main rooms for not having enough berries on them. And now given fake modeling clay berries and stuck in anyway on shelves and behind pictures. There were two stockings hanging from the mantel place of the small schoolroom grate. There were twilight paintings, all blobby blue skies and violently green glass, grass, and red houses with four square windows. There were normal things. She straightened up and stared at them, her fingernails beating a thoughtful tattoo on a wooden pencil case. The door was opened. It revealed the tussled shape of Twyla hanging onto the doorknob with one hand. Susan, there's a monster under my bed again. The click of Susan's fingernails stopped. I can hear it moving about. Susan sighed and turned towards the trial child. All white trial all white trila, I'll be along directly. The girl nodded and went back to her room, leaping into bed from a distance as a precaution against claws. There was a metallic ting as Susan withdrew the poker from the little brass stand it shared with the tongs and the coal shovel. She shied. Normality was what you made it. She went into the children's bedroom and leaned over as if to tuck Twyla up. Then her hand darted down and under the bed. She grabbed a handful of hair. She pulled. The boogeyman came out like a cork, but before it could get its balance, it found itself spread eagled across the wall with one arm behind its back. But it did manage to turn its head to see Susan's face glaring at it from a few inches away. Gawain bounced up and down on his bed. Do the voice on it! Do the voice on it! Do the voice on it! He shouted. Don't do the voice! Don't do the voice! pleaded the boogeyman urgently. Hit it on the head with the poker. Not the poker. Not the poker. It's you, isn't it? Said Susan from this afternoon. Aren't you going to poke it with the poker? Said Gawain. Not the poker. Why the boogeyman? New in town, whispered Susan. Yes. The boogeyman's forehead wrinkled with puzzlement. Here, how come you can see me? Then this is a friendly warning, understand? Because it's Hogwarts. The boogeyman tried to move. You call this friendly? Ah, you want to try for on friendly, said Susan, adjusting her grip. No, 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 I, I like friendly. This house is out of bounds, right? You a witch or something, moaned the boogeyman. I'm just something. Now, you won't be around here again, will you? Otherwise, it'll be a blanket next time. No, I mean it. We'll put your head under the blanket. No, it's got fluffy bunnies on it. No, off you go, Doug. The boogeyman half fell, half ran towards the door. It's not right, it mumbled. Not supposed to see us if you ain't dead or magic. It's not right. Try number 19, said Susan, relenting a little. The governess there doesn't believe in boogeyman. Right, said the monster, hopefully. She believes in algebra, though. Ah, nice. The boogeyman grinned hugely. It was amazing the sort of mischief that could be uh, caused in a house where no one in authority thought you existed. I'll be off then, it said, or happy hogs watch. Possibly, said Susan as it slunk away. That wasn't as much fun as the one last night, said Gawain, getting between the seats again. You know, when he kicked them in his trousers. Just you two get to sleep now, said Susan. Verity said the sooner we get to sleep, the sooner the hog father would come, said Twyla conversationally. Yes, said Susan. Unfortunately, that might be the case. The remark passed right over their heads. She wasn't sure why it had gone through hers, but she knew enough to trust her senses. She hated that kind of sense. It ruined your life, but it was the sense she had been born with. The children were tucked in, and she closed the door quietly and went back to the schoolroom. Something had changed. She glared at the stockings, but they were unfulfilled. A paper chain rustled. She stared at the tree, tinsel had been twined around it, badly pasted together decorations had been hung on it, and on top was the fairy made of... She crossed her arms, looked up at the ceiling, and sighed theatrical. theatrically. It's you, isn't it? She said. Squeak? Yes, it is. You're sticking out your arms like a scarecrow, and you've stuck a little star on your scythe, haven't you? 
The deaf of rats hung his head guiltily. Squeak. You're not fooling anyone. Squeak. Get down from here this minute. Squeak. And what did you do with the fairy? Subbed under a cushion on the chair, said a voice from the cells on the other side of the room. There was a clinking voice. There was a clicking noise, and the raven's voice added, These damn eyeballs are hard, aren't they? Susan raced across the room and snatched the bowl away, so fast that the raven somersaulted and landed on its back. They're walnuts, he shouted as they bounced around her. Not eyeballs. This is a schoolroom. The difference between a school and a, 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 a raven delicatessen is that they hardly ever have eyeballs lying around in bowls in case a raven drops in for a quick snack. Understand? No eyeballs. The world is full of small, round things that aren't eyeballs, okay? The raven's own eyes revolved. And I suppose a bit of warm livers out of the question? Shut up. I want both of you out of here right now. I don't know how you got in here. There's a law against coming down the chimney on Hogsbots night, but I don't want you back in my life. Understand? The rat said you ought to be warned even if you were crazy, said the raven sulkily. I didn't want to come. There's a donkey drop dead just outside the city gates. I'll be lucky now if I get a hoof. Warned? Said Susan. There it was again. The change in the weather of the mind. A sensation of tangible time. The deaf of rats nodded. There's a scrabbling sound far overhead. A few flakes of soot drop down the chimney. Squeak, said the rat, but very quietly. Susan was aware of a new sensation. As a fish might be aware of a new tide. A spring of fresh water flowing into the sea. Time was pouring into the world. She glanced up at the clock. It was just on half past six. The rat says... The rat says you'd better watch out. And let's keep going for a little bit more. Uh, we're almost about 100 pages in. Let's end there. There were others at work on this signing Hogs Watts Eve. The Sandman was out and about dragging his sack from bed to bed. Jack Frost wandered from window pane to window pane making icy patterns, and one tiny hunch shape slid and slithered along the gutter, squelching its feet in slush and swearing under its breath. It wore a stained black suit and on its head the type of hat known in various parts of the multiverse as bowler, derby, or the one that makes you look a bit of a tit. The hat had been pressed down very firmly, and since the creature had long, pointy ears, these had been forced out sideways and gave it the look of a small, malignant wingnut. The thing was a gnome by shape, but a fairy by profession. Fairies aren't necessarily little twinkly creatures. It's purely a job description, and the commonest ones aren't even visible. A fairy is simply any creature currently employed under supernatural laws to take things away or, as in the case of the small creature presently climbing up the inside of a drainpipe and swearing, to bring things. Oh, yes, he does. Someone has to do it, and he looks the right gnome for the job. Oh, yes. Sydney was worried. He didn't like violence, and there had been a lot of it in the last few days, if days pass in this place. The men, well, they only seem to find life interesting when they're doing something sharp to someone else. And while that didn't bother them much in the same way that lions didn't trouble themselves with ants. They certainly worried him. But not as much as Tia Teme did. Even the brute called Chicken Wire treated Tia Teme with caution, if not respect. And the monster called Banjo just followed him around like a puppy. The enormous man was watching him now. He reminded Sidney too much of Ronnie Jinks. The bully who had made his life miserable at Gammer Wimblestone's dame school. Ronnie hadn't been a pupil. He was the old woman's grandson or nephew or something. Which gave him a license to hang around the place and beat up any kid smaller or weaker or brighter than he was. Which more or less meant he had the whole world to choose from. In those circumstances, it was particularly unfair that he always chose Sydney. 
Sidney hadn't hated Rodney. He'd been too frightened. He'd wanted to be his friend. Oh, so much. Because that way, just possibly, he wouldn't have had his head trodden on such a lot. And would actually get to eat his lunch instead of having it thrown in the privy. And it had been a good day when it had been his lunch. And then, despite all Ronnie's best efforts, Sidney had grown up and gone to university. University. Occasionally, his mother told, told him how Ronnie was getting on. She assumed, in the way of mothers, that because they had been small boys at school together, they had been friends. Apparently, he ran a fruit stall and was married to a girl called Angie. Who was, according to Sydney's mother, a bit of a cat since her father owned half a half in the eel pie shop in Gleam Street. You must know her. Got all her own teeth and a wooden leg you'd hardly notice. Got a sister called Continence. Lovely girl. Why didn't she invite her along for tea next time he was over? Not, not that she hardly ever saw her son, the big wizard at all these days. But you never knew. And if the magic thing didn't work out, then a quarter share in a thriving eel pie business was not to be sneezed at. This was not enough punishment, Sidney considered. Banjo even breathed like Ronnie, who had to concentrate on such an intellectual exercise and always had one blocked nostril. And his mouth open all the time. He looked as though he was living on invisible plankton. He tried to keep his mind on what he was doing and ignored the labored gurgling behind him. A change in its tone made him look up. Fascinating, said Teoteme. You make it look so easy. Sidney sat back nervously. Uh, it should be fine now, sir, he said. It just got a bit scuffed when we were piling up the... He couldn't bring himself to say it. Even as it averted his eyes away from the heap, it was the sound they made. The things. We don't need to repeat the spell, said Teoteme. Oh, it'll keep going forever, said Sidney. The simple ones do. It's just the state chains powered by the, the, it just keeps going. He swallowed. So he said, I was thinking since you don't actually need me, sir, perhaps Mr. Brown seems to be having some trouble with the locks on the top floor. The door we couldn't open, remember? I'm sure you'll want to help. Sydney's face fell. Uh, I'm not a locksmith. They appear to be magical. Sydney opened his mouth to say, but I'm very bad at magical locks, and then thought much better of it. He had already fathomed that if Chiatame wanted you to do something and you weren't very good at it, then your best plan, in fact, quite possibly your only plan, was to learn to be good at it very quickly. Sydney was not a fool. He'd seen the way the others reacted around Chiatame, and they were men who did things he'd only dreamed of. Not that is things he wanted to do or wanted done to him, just things that he dreamed of in the armpit of a bad night. At what point he was relieved to see Medium Dave walk down the stairs. And it said a lot for the effect of Tietame scare, stare, that anyone could be relieved to have it punctuated by someone like Medium Dave. We found another guard, sir, up on the sixth floor. He's been hiding. Tietame stood up. Oh dear, he said, not trying to be heroic, was he? He's just scared. So we let him go? Let him go, said Tetemi. Thought you messy. I'll get up there. Come along, Mr. Wizard. Sydney followed him reluctantly up the stairs. The tower, if that's what it was, he thought. He was used to the odd architecture at Onsen University, and this made UU look normal. It was a hollow tube. No fewer than four spiral staircases climbed the inside, crisscrossing on landings and occasionally passing through one another in defiance of generally accepted physics. But that was practically normal for an alumnus of Onsen University, although technically Sydney had not alumned. What threw the eyes was the absence of shadows. You didn't notice shadows, how they delineated things, how they gave texture to the world, until they weren't there. The white marble, if that's what it was, seemed to glow from the inside. Even when the impossible sun shone through the window, it barely caused faint gray smudges where honest shadows should be. The tower seemed to avoid darkness. 
that was even more frightening than the times when, after a complicated landing, you found yourself walking up by stepping down the other side of a stair, and the distant floor now hung overhead like a ceiling. He noticed the other men shut their eyes when that happened. Tia Timmy, though, took those stairs three at a time, laughing like a kid with a new toy. They reached an upper landing and followed a corridor. The others were gathered by a closed door. He's barricaded himself in, said Chicken Wire. Tia Teme tapped on it. You in there, he said. Come on out. You have my word you won't be harmed. No. Tia Teme stood back. Banjo, knock it down, he said. Banjo lumbered forward. The doors withstood a couple of massive kicks and then burst open. The guard was cowering behind an overturned cabinet. He cringed back as Tia Teme stepped over it. What are you doing here, he shouted. Who are you? Ah, I'm glad you asked. I'm your worst nightmare, said Tia Teme cheerfully. The man shuddered. You, you mean the one with the giant cabbage and the sort of whirring knife thing? Sorry, said Tia Teme, looking momentarily nonplussed. Then you're the one where I'm falling only instead of ground underneath it's all. No, in fact, I'm the guard say. Oh, uh, not the one where there's all this kind of, you know, mud and everything goes blue. No, I'm... Oh, shit. Then you're the one where there's this door, only there's no floor beyond it, and there's these claws? No, said Tia Temme. Not that one. He withdrew a dagger from his sleeve. I'm the one where this man comes out of nowhere and kills you stone dead. The guard grinned with leap. Oh, that one, he said. But that one's not very... He crumpled around Tia Teme's suddenly out thrust fist. And then, just like others had done, he had fate. Rather a terrible act there, I feel, Tia Teme said as the man vanished. But it is nearly Hogswatch, after all. Deaf, pillows slipping gently under his red robe, stood in the middle of the nursery carpet. It was an old one. Things ended up in the nursery when they had been and they had seen a complete tour of duty in the rest of the house. Long ago, someone had made it by carefully knotting long bits of brightly colored rag into a sacking, sacking base, giving it the look of a deflated Rastafarian hedgehog. Things lived among the rags. There were old rusks, bit of toy, buckets of dust. It had seen life. It may even have evolved some. Now the occasional lump of grubby, melting snow dropped onto it. Susan was crimson with anger. I mean, why? She demanded, walking around the figure. This is Hogswatch. It's supposed to be jolly with mistletoe and holly and, and other things ending in ollie. It's a time when people want to feel good about things and eat until they explode. It's a time when they want to see all their relatives. See, stopped that sentence. I mean, it's a time when humans are really human, she said, and they don't want a, a skeleton at the feast. Especially one who, I might add, who's wearing a false beard and has got a damn cushion stuffed up his robe. I mean, why? Jeff looked nervous. Albert said it would help me get into the spirit of the thing, or it's good to see you again. There was a small squelchy noise. Susan spun around, grateful right now for any distraction. Don't think I can't hear you. They're grapes, understand? And the other things are Satsumas. Get out of the fruit bowl. Can't blame a bird for trying, said the raven softly from the table. And you, you leave those nuts alone. They're for tomorrow. Squeak, said the deaf of rats, swallowing hurriedly. Susan turned back at death. The hog's father's artificial stomach was now a going level. This is a nice house, he said, and this is a good job, and it's real with normal people. And I was looking forward to a real life where normal things happen, and suddenly the old circus comes to town. Look at yourselves. Three stooges, no waiting. Well, I don't know what's going on, but you can all leave again, right? This is my life. It doesn't belong to any of you. It's not going to. There was a muffled curse, a rust of soot, and a skinny old man landed in the grate. Bum, he said. Good grief, raged Susan. And here is Pixie Albert. 
Well, well, well. Come along in, do. If the real Hogfather doesn't come soon, there's not going to be room. He won't be joining us, said Death. The pillow slid softly onto the rug. Oh, and why not? Both the children did letters to him. There's rules, you know. Yes, there are rules. And they're on the list. I checked it. Albert pulled the pointy hat off his head and spat out some soot. Right, he did. Twice, he said. Anything to drink around here? So what have you turned up for? Susan demanded. And if it's for business reasons, I will add that that outfit is in extremely poor taste. The hog father is unavailable. Unavailable at Hog's Watch? Yes. Why? He is, let me see, there isn't an entirely appropriate human word, so let's settle for dead. Yes, he is dead. And that, ladies, gentlemen, and others, is where we're going to leave it for this evening. Uh, thank you for indulging me as I read a personal favorite. Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night.